you don't have to say that you're unable to get out of a gang because you're worrying about what your homeboys and friends will do to you, but yet you're not worried about what your enemies will do to you. So it's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron. You were tough enough. You had enough courage to get in a gang, but you don't have enough courage to get out. That's absurd. As you know, there are so many interpretations of leadership. I believe that not only must an individual have the uh, noetic ability, being intelligent, things of that nature, but uh, he or she must have uh, charisma. They must have insight, foresight, compassion, and passion. They must uh, be able to mea culpa, which is uh, to acknowledge one's own fault. They must be able to uh, empathize. They must be uh, strategic-minded. Uh, they must be critical thinkers. They must be magnanimous. They must also have integrity, which is very important. They must understand uh, redemption. They must have uh, the ability to change. And they must have courage. Unless you heal yourself, then how possibly can you help to turn the lives around of other people? You must first go within. You must do a lot of introspection, correct the wrongs that uh, afflict one's own mind and body. Then and only then can you honestly and seriously reach out to other people. Hi, this is Tony Robbins. Welcome to another edition of Power Talk. Listen, if you've studied my work for any period of time, you know that for the last 28 years of my life, I've been a hunter of human excellence. I've literally been obsessed to know what is the difference in people. Why is it some individuals are given everything, all the educational opportunity, economic freedom, and most importantly, love, and they turn into tormentors of other humans? People take advantage, or in spite of all the advantages that have been given to them, they end up in a place like rehab. And then we find these other individuals, people who've been through hell on earth, people who've been tormented, people who've been physically, sexually, emotionally abused. And somehow they don't just forgive, but they find a way to convert that pain into the drive to contribute. People that inspire us, people that have made the difference in this world. And I want to tell you that today I'm going to introduce you to a man who inspires me, a man who's touched my soul and I believe will touch yours as well. And it may be a gradual conversation. You may not be struck in the first few moments. But I guarantee if you'll listen to this entire conversation, at the end you won't just be moved. You'll remember what a human being is capable of. You'll remember the transformative power that we all have within ourselves. Because we all have moments in our lives where we feel overwhelmed, or we feel like there's enormous injustice, or we feel like we're not enough, or we feel a self-anger or frustration, or even a self-hate for something we've done. We all at times need to find a way to redeem ourselves, not only in our own minds, but in life, to have our life have a greater sense of meaning than just ourselves. In this hunt for human excellence, by the way, I've had the privilege of meeting some extraordinary human beings. Some have since passed, people like Mother Teresa, people like Princess Diana, people still alive like Nelson Mandela, Presidents Reagan and Clinton. I, I mean, I could go through the list on and on, greats in sports and politics and business greats in the entertainment business. And what I've found more than anything else is the difference in human beings is their decisions. It's in our moments of decision that our destiny is shaped. I mean, if you think about it and you look at your life today, everything you love about it and anything you're not happy about as well, it's been shaped by decisions. Sometimes by decisions that seem very small in the moment, but they led you in a different direction. Like you decided to go to a certain school or take up a certain profession and while you're at that school or at that work, you met the person who is now your husband or your wife. Our life is shaped by the decisions of what we're going to eat, how we're going to live, whether we're going to exercise or not, what our beliefs are going to be about God, what we're going to value and what we're going to ignore. And it's our decisions much more than our conditions that shape our lives. But certainly no one would disagree that the conditions we grew up in very often will shape our decisions at an early age. What this interview is about is the power to make new choices. The power to change your entire life with some new decisions. 
And as I say, those decisions can be made in a moment. Whenever I hear people say, well, I've tried to change for years, or it took me 10 years to make a change, I always say to them, no, it took you a moment. A moment of decision, a moment in which you cut off any possibility except that which you've now committed yourself to do and to be. It's a decision about identity, about who we are, what we stand for, and the meaning of our lives that shapes us. And that decision is usually made unconsciously, usually made in reaction to how do we gain esteem or respect or connection or worthiness or love from people around us, some of which have standards that don't support life, have standards that really just are about themselves. What transforms us, I believe, and what makes someone a leader is when they decide to serve, which means when we decide that there's something more valuable than just ourselves, when we're willing to even make sacrifices, when we're willing to do whatever is necessary to serve something more than ourselves, magic happens. I do believe that motive does matter. If your motive is merely to take care of yourself, there's very little that is given to you because life supports life. But insights, spiritual breakthroughs, strength, courage, an indomitable will shows up when there's something to preserve beside yourself. When you're here to try and take care of your family or your friends or your community or the world, things come to you. And I can tell you my own life. I mean, I'm a kid from Azusa, California. <laughs> People in California don't even know what that is, most of them. And there's nothing special in my life that prepared me to have the privilege to speak with you right now or any of the other leaders that I've had a chance to visit with. But I can tell you, that my love for people and my desire to serve has given me insights that I wouldn't have had if it was just how can I get something for myself and don't get me wrong it's not like I'm some perfect person or I haven't been selfish I have been we all have been but the man you're about to meet has moved out of that stage of living into a center of gravity a place where his primary focus is on giving and as a result he's free even though you're going to meet him from the cell he resides in that's right in this session we're going to transport you to San Quentin Prison. In a few moments, we'll be joining a man on death row, Stanley Tukey Williams. If you're not familiar with Stanley, he's the man who co-founded the infamous Crips from South Central LA, a gang that has been known for its viciousness and has grown literally to an international organization that creates terror and transports drugs and produces murders around the world. Not something he's proud of. In fact, something that he wore as a badge of strength and identity for most of his life. But about 15 or 16 years ago, after spending nearly six years in solitary confinement, this man began to create a new path for his life. A path of not only his own personal transformation and redemption, but one that has saved the lives of literally hundreds of thousands of young men and women, as well as people that would have been victimized by them. Stan has written nine books for young people to keep them out of gangs. He's personally brokered the peace between the Crips and the Bloods and saved innumerable lives there. He's done what has seemed to be impossible by taking his life, which was a warning, and turning it into an example. And we all have that choice, to be a warning or an example. Every religious book, whether it be the Bible, the Torah, the New Testament, the Koran, all great spiritual works of any direction, all are filled with stories to guide us. Some of those are warnings, some of those are examples. I would submit to you the man you're about to meet is one of the most extraordinary examples, a man worth emulating in the second half of his life and has used all of the pain of the first half and all of the hurt for a greater good. So in a few moments, as I say, you'll be meeting Stan Williams. We're waiting for the collect call that he'll be making to us directly from his cell on death row where he sits literally only a few feet away from the execution chamber. On December 13th, only a few weeks from the time of this recording, he's scheduled to be executed. Ironically, for a set of murders that not only Stan claims that he did not commit, but that the California Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, nine judges out of 24, have said that his conviction is a travesty that it was based on racism, manipulation of the facts, and that the case must be reopened. In fact, the judge who wrote the dissenting opinion is an arch-conservative Republican who has never done anything to support anyone on death row, including individuals that she opposed staying the execution of because they were mentally challenged. In other words, one of the nine judges that believes Stanley Williams' case needs to not only be reopened, but that he deserves clemency, is a judge who actually opposed 
uh, to strip away the politically correct language, those are mentally retarded and who have committed murders from having a stay of their executions. She doesn't care whether or not they were in charge of their faculties. An eye for an eye is the stand that this judge is taking. But after reviewing the details of this case, she and eight other judges have suggested this case needs to be reopened. And all the judges said that based on Stanley's last decade and a half of contribution and nine Nobel Prize nominations, by the way, he's been nominated for his good works for five Nobel Peace Prizes and four Nobel Prizes for literature. Not by just local homeboys, but by the Swiss Parliament, for example, by individuals from around the world who have been touched and impacted by him. So only Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger can save this man's life. And maybe in listening to this message, you'll be moved enough to do something to help him as well by contacting Governor Schwarzenegger's office by email, or by phone call, or if the time has passed and he is still standing, uh, you'll be moved by his message to make your life greater, make a greater contribution. If for some reason... The governor's conscience is not reached if he's not convinced. And you're listening to this after Stanley's passing, after he's been executed by the state. Then at least you'll know who the man really was and who he really is. With that, I will pause for a moment and we'll wait to meet Stanley Williams. Stan, first of all, thank you for joining us. Are you actually calling from your cell? Yes, I'm uh, calling from uh, San Quentin's death row. Yes. A uh, cell that uh, an individual is placed in when he's scheduled to be executed uh, within you know, 45 days to 30 days. Now you're facing death. Do you fear it? No, I can't fear what uh, I can't really fathom. I'm fully aware of life. And I understand that, but as far as death, uh, no one has ever come back to apprise me as to what, you know, uh, entails with death. So I can't feel, feel what uh, I'm not uh, familiar with. Now, I, know, I don't want to die. No, I, I, I know that. Well, when you and I met for the first time here um, there at San Quentin, you said something very interesting in the beginning of our conversation. You said, these people think they know me, but they know of me. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, primarily, everything that, as far as CDC is concerned and San Quentin officials are concerned, the only things they know about me is documented in the uh, central file, which we call the C file. And within those pages, they can, in a sense, choreograph to make it so that any individual can be uh, portrayed as a monster or a beast or, you know, some kind of animal. But yet, uh, none of them have ever sat down for... Uh, you know, a pretty good amount of time to discuss who I am or try to gauge exactly where I'm coming from or even to see or determine whether or not what I'm doing is sincere. Well, that's obviously the one of the most important issues out there. Many people are outraged at the idea of your clemency, and as you know, we're working very hard to make sure the governor sees it from a different perspective. But very many people think this is all an act. Well, you know, you've been doing this now for, what, 15, 16 years, making these contributions. Yes. Tell us a little bit, if you would, about who were you and who are you today and what's created the change. Well, first and foremost, I must say that uh, it's an impossibility for anyone to put up a, you know, a continuous facade that can last this long. Uh, I've always stated that it will always come to the light. Uh, you can't just continuously be clandestine with uh, evil. It will eventually be shown, and especially in here, because there's enough informants and provocateurs and things of that nature to expose any individual who is actually living foul. So nobody is that uh, good at acting. No one. Hmm. And what? Uh, tell us, who are you today? Well, I'm definitely not the uh, Stanley Tookie Williams that I was uh, back in the past. In 1988 through 1994, I experienced uh, a transition, a redemptive transition. In other words, I had to educate myself and then battle my uh, personal demons and eliminate uh, my vices and um, to cultivate my uh, spirituality. And you, you actually spent, what, six years in solitary confinement? Uh, a little over six, uh, six and a half years. 
during that time, how did you keep from going stir crazy, as they described there? I know at one point you were seeing the walls coming in, and you know. Oh I yes, that was uh, claustrophobic. I was claustrophobic at the time, and, but I, you know, it's as of now, I haven't experienced. I haven't experienced that in all close to two decades, fortunately. Hmm. And I believe it has a lot to do with my transition and being at peace. Mm -hmm. with myself. Tell us a little bit about why you started the uh, Crips years ago and what, what formulated you because you were a violent man at that stage of your life obviously. It's uh, something that I was taught to believe that in order to get my point across, in order to prove my manhood, violent was the motif, the dominant theme. And you were surrounded by it, you were sharing with me prior that, uh, you know, not only would adults uh, pay for kids to fight, but I guess they'd light animals, you know, birds oh. on fire. And oh, oh, yes. I mean, many things, as I stated in my memoir, Blue Rage, Black Redemption, uh, adults, uh, they were so competitive, everything uh, was up for grabs. Uh, as I stated, they would, you know, put gasoline on pigeons and see which one would fly the furthest and whichever bird flew the furthest that individual would win I mean everything was fighting uh, you'd find uh, mothers and fathers fighting uh, boyfriends and girlfriends uh, criminals against criminals pimps against their so-called prostitutes and uh, yes we as youth were uh, fighting one another and I was nothing but seven or eight years old we'd put on gloves and we'd fight uh, one another until you know, whichever one fell down, the winner would get a couple of dollars and so would the loser. And when did you, tell us about the transformation. I know you came from Louisiana and I know uh, you had concerns about protecting your mother in the beginning, but there was a point in which you became rather physically strong and more dominant and started using violence. When was that and what triggered it? Well, it, it was pretty much dealing with the neighboring gangs uh, in the immediate area. You couldn't, at that time, talk to individuals because talk would be considered as a sign of weakness. So any type of powwows or truths were uh, considered to be uh, obsolete, passe, uh, irrelevant. And I felt, when I came from camp, uh, I was 16 when I went there, and uh, I was 17 when I left. But when I got back in society, I felt that the only way that these individuals could respect another person who, weren't, who wasn't into uh, gang violence was to use violence against them. And so I got my friends together, my homeboys together, and we dwelled upon that. And that's how you formed the Crips? Yes, along with Raymond. Yes, well, that came later, but we were fighting other gangs prior to the uh, development of the Crips. Now, Years did, before. And was it 1971 that the two of you joined forces? How'd that come about? And tell us a little bit about the transformation you shared with me, the transformation of your body while you were in juvenile hall at 16. Well, I was convinced by this uh, white uh, gym teacher, and he consistently bugged me about lifting weights. And I thought he was out of his mind because uh, there was no way in the world I thought that I would start lifting weights. But in order to get him off my back, because he was quite adamant about getting me to lift weights, he tried to convince me that I had the physique that uh, would pack on a huge amount of muscle, which I didn't believe. I thought he was trying to dupe me. So when I did decide to lift, you know, the iron, um, I noticed immediately the gains that I was making, and it made me feel that discipline from it was just tremendous and I continually started to uh, live while I was in uh, Camp Rocky in San Dimas, California. So you, you actually bulked up to an almost inhuman capacity, didn't you? Well, yes. It seemed like I evolved with age. As I was, when I was 17, I had 17 inch arms. When I was 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, 20 like that, 21, 21 like that. Wow. And uh, no steroids, no uh, creatine or any of those things because uh, in our neighborhood you couldn't find that even if you wanted to. And I asked you uh, when we were talking at San Quentin, I said, uh, what kept you going? You said the discipline, the pump, but then you gave me some other insight. What kept you going? Well, I mean, not only was it the, uh, the discipline, the discipline was the essential part 
of my drive, of my uh, resolution, my determination. But um, I must also say, some may think it's petty, but I really enjoyed the attention that I received from uh, the opposite sex. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the female. You know, uh, I really enjoyed uh, how they responded. They always wanted me to take my shirt off because they couldn't believe it. You know, so. <laughs> That's enough incentive for any man. <laughs> well, you know, that was definitely my incentive. That, that was more important to me than fighting or anything else. Uh, yeah, so I, I must admit that that's called being human. It sounds like to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yes. So, uh, so Stan, with this body, I guess you could intimidate almost anybody at that time. But I guess also you must have been an incredible fighter. Well, I had to be able to protect myself and to be able to uh, help those who are around me as well. So uh, I'm not one to brag about my pugilistic skills, but let's just say that I had the fortitude and the wherewithal to defend myself uh, with my hands, not with a knife, not with a gun or any type of weapon, with my hands. And that's what I was uh, noted for. That's how I earned my reputation for being able to fight and win, regardless of the odds. And where did you get that will, Stan? Where do you think it came from? Because it's the same will you're using today to be there on death row and at the same time focus on contributing to other people. I mean, I see that will in your eyes. I wish people could be looking at you right now because your voice represents part of you, but there's a, a feeling and emotion in your eyes. I have to tell you, my friend, that is that pierces someone because it has such pure integrity in it. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not yeah. blowing... Yeah. stuff at you there's I wish people could see your eyes and, and see your presence besides hearing your voice as well but what what do you think gave you this will because this will is amazing I mean, when you went into prison you'd have seven guys jump you in the beginning you know how did you go into that how did you deal with that mentally as a young black boy I had to fight all my life I believe that as soon as I was conceived I had to have the will to fight. It has more to do with survival, the need to survive under any circumstances, uh, regardless of the odds or regardless of the conditions. And uh, that's something I believe in me was innate, uh, something that I was born with. However, I believe that it was shaped and formed uh, through the discipline of driving iron. And the, the uh, my determination became greater. Hmm. Now, you, when we first talked, you said that you're an extremist. You're an extremist then, you're an extremist now. Yes. An extremist, how then, how now? Well, as an extremist, when I say that I was into gang, I was a crip, uh, the fact of the matter is I didn't care who knew it. I wanted the world to know it, and I didn't hide it. Uh, my name, the name Tookie, and the Crips were synonymous, so there was no mistaking. That's why I never had to wear tattoos, because people knew exactly who I was and what I stood for. And that same fortitude, that same uh, resolution that I had as being an extremist is also applicable to now. In other words, I don't have to straddle the fence. I don't have to play as if, okay, I can be a crip and I can help children. I knew better than that. I've seen where others have failed. I've seen uh, the failure in their efforts to straddle the fence. And being an extremist, I, I'm not a hypocrite. Therefore, I couldn't do both. So once I decided to leave the gang life alone, it was for real. And therefore, with my redemption and my self-transition, my efforts to help children, I do that in the extreme. That's why when I write those books for children and my memoir as well, I didn't sugarcoat anything. I didn't veneer it. I had to be frank. I had to be candid because that's the only way to get my point across. And being an extremist, I do it in that manner because for me, it works. And I believe that those who are out there in society, the youth, whether they're in society or in juvenile hall or YA or in prison, I believe that they can relate to that. They don't want to hear the sugar coatings of, of, about uh, this life or about uh, what they've been experiencing. They want to hear the truth. And that's the only way that I can give it. Why do you think you'd be able to reach those people that uh, most people think are unreachable? What is it about you and your message that reaches them? 
Well, once again, as I told you, uh, Sunday, that there's nothing phenomenal about me. There's nothing uh, special about me. It's just the fact that I can empathize and they can empathize with my experience as opposed to listening to their parents, unfortunately, ministers, teachers, counselors, and people of that ilk. The fact is that they can empathize with me because they know that I've experienced this. There's not a youth on this planet who can tell me that I don't understand what they're going through. They can't tell me what it's like to, you know, address drugs or deal drugs or to admit violence or to be in camp or to be in juvenile hall or to go to jail or to be in prison. All these things or are... To getting, <laughs> or to be shot. Yes, or to have been shot because I was shot out. I've experienced all that. So it enables me to get my foot at the door, whereas others can't even open the door at all. Now, Stan, you know, what is, tell us, what does redemption mean for you? What is the, what's the meaning of that word? Because it's, it's the mantra of your life, and I know it's not something that happens once for you. It's something that you live every day. What does it really mean to you, and how, is it, how does one create it? Because many people have lived things in their life that they perceive to be severe, even if others don't, or are severe. They've done horrible things. How does someone transform from who we were to who we are made to be at a spiritual and emotional and psychological level? First and foremost, you're talking about something that uh, requires not just discipline, but you have to want it. You have to have the willpower to go after it and get it. You really have to experience a sense of remorse and want to do something to help other people. And even prior to that, you have to, as I stated before to you, you have to develop a conscience. And for me, I developed a conscience through first uh, educating myself. And by educating myself, I was able to start to reason. And through this form of reasoning, I was able to uh, initiate a sense of uh, common sense, knowing right from wrong. And because without a conscience, it doesn't make any difference. You can be highly educated, but you can be, you'll end up being an educated fool without conscience. Because there are plenty of individuals, not only behind bars, but individuals who are in society who are highly educated. And still, they have no conscience. Therefore, without a conscience, they can do all sorts of nefarious things. Uh, they can rob and cheat and, and kill and initiate violence towards other people. And so, by me being able to develop a conscience, it helped me so that I can learn and understand that my life, what I perpetuated through the crypts, that legacy was something that I shouldn't have been doing and I didn't need to do and it was all it was doing was hurting other people. So I realized that through my redemption, which is more than just making a transition, it's being able to reach out to other people and help others. And that's when I stood what redemption meant. It's beyond yourself. It's initiating selfless acts or selfless deeds towards helping others. And you've been doing that for, what, 16 years now? Oh, uh, for quite a while, over a decade. <laughs> and now, now tell me something. You know, you, you told me when we met that you developed a love for words. Tell us how this transformation and this redemption began. What shifted you? Because as I understand it, when you first came into the jailhouse after you were convicted, you took over the place. Tell us about what that was like then and how you were running the show. And then how do you well, go from running the show to, to being a man who's focused on helping as many other human beings as you can? Well, I'll, let's just say that uh, my name rung louder than anyone else's th yeah. throughout those years. Yes. And uh, I brought a lot of focus, undue attention to myself. Like I said, I never experienced an epiphany. Or my redemption, it, it never happened overnight. It took years, a consistent years of uh, worrying about what my friends would think, what my homeboys would think, would they think I was weak, or was I turning soft, or something like that. I, I was worrying about that, and eventually I got to the point to where it didn't matter. When you're striving to do something that is positive, something, uh, we're talking about a true cause, when you're striving for a true cause, it doesn't matter what the consequences are. Just as easily as I didn't worry about what the consequences were when I was in a gang, I definitely 
shouldn't worry about it when I get out. Uh, you people talking about how they worry about, well, you know, if you know you get in a gang and you can't get out, that's, that's a myth. I demythologize that just uh, being alive and showing them that that's not so. You don't have to say that you're unable to get out of a gang because you're worrying about what your homeboys and friends are do to you, but yet you're not worried about what your enemies are do to you. So it's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron. You were tough enough. You had enough courage to get in a gang, but you don't have enough courage to get out. That's absurd. I I, that, that line will not, if anyone bring that type of statement to me, I can demythologize it. I can refute it. I can dispute it. I can renunciate it clearly with no problem because that is not so. That's a myth. Well, these, you took uh, a sizable chance, and I guess that must have been your thinking when, uh, I know when I talked to Barbara, she said when she first came to meet you, she thought of you as a thug, she thought you'd be uneducated, she thought, you know, you were the scum of the earth, and she just wanted to do the education for the public of the history of the Crips and the Bloods. But, uh, and you, I guess, had some beliefs about her. Tell us a little bit about your first meeting and the preconceived notions you both had. Uh, no different uh, than Barbara. We know that the courts and uh, the jury and uh, society, they all have that preconceived notion that I'm a beast and that I'm incapable of redemption. They say that I'm irredeemable, you're, you know, not teachable, unteachable, and unreachable. But that's not so. But yet, uh, that is what... Uh, Miss Barbara Beckman thought as well. She had that predisposition that uh, I was just an old, older version of the, you know, the thugs out there, the thugs that she met in juvenile halls and talked to in, in prisons. But when she got here, uh, I assumed that she told you that she was totally blown away with my intellect, with my ability to uh, articulate myself, and my appearance, and the, you know, the dignity that I hold that radiates from me regardless of being in this place. Yes. In fact, she said to me that when you walked in the room, even though you were in chains, she noticed everyone was, everyone was calling you Mr. Williams, including the guards, and there was just a level of respect for you as a man that she had never seen before. That's what started shifted. But I guess you probably were a little bit uh, judgmental about her in the beginning as well, weren't you? Well, well of course. I thought that she was a modern-day, uh, contemporary-day um, bourgeois. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, and as she said at that particular time, someone she was. Yes. But she didn't condescend, and that's what I appreciate about her. She didn't condescend. She didn't look down on me, and uh, she treated me like a human being. And that's all I asked parts to do is treat me like a human being, and I will reciprocate with no problem. I guess you have. You've been an A prisoner. They thought you would only last a week, um, but you moved from B to A, and you've been that, on that status for, what, 10 years? Uh, over. Over, over 10, 10 years. years, yes. That's wonderful. And, uh, well, to make a long story short, she definitely didn't go away with thinking that I was some archaic uh, so-called gangster who was reveling in his past, and so... She was totally surprised. And in regards to my love for words, well, you know, I was introduced to a dictionary by a chaplain and, and an uh, imam had given me a thesaurus. And instead of me using the methodology that Uncle Max had used in regards to learning words in which he alphabetized them, going down the A's, the B's, I thought that was quite tedious. So what I would do is just uh, randomly, you know, pick words uh, throughout the dictionary that caught my eye, and I would learn them. I started off with uh, my own form of uh, mnemonics, which means uh, a technique for learning, for memory for memorizing. So what I did was I'd get a sheet of paper and I'd fold it in half and I'd put the ten words on one side and on the other side I would put the uh, definitions of each word. And I found out that I had an excellent ability to retain words. Hundreds of them, thousands of them. So I started off with ten each day and then eventually it increased uh, to 20, 30, 40, 50 on up to 100. And I would have individuals out there on the yard that I knew test me and each one would try to throw me. You know, uh, they'd throw out words and things like that and which they thought that uh, I would miss or misspell or misenunciate or, uh, you know, wouldn't remember the uh, definition, the semantics of a word. But 
No, uh, they weren't able to. It never happened. Mm. So I can say that. That that I'm really proud of being able to have a love for words. Uh, not only the English language, because I believe every child, uh, regardless of their background, should have a command of the English language, especially living in this country. So in order to do so, they must know as many words as possible. They must study it and be able to articulate themselves clearly in order to get their point across. And uh, I believe that they can do it. I did it, so I definitely believe that they can. Did you begin this while you were in solitary confinement? Uh, yes, that's where you know, I, I was able to do a lot of uh, studying because in solitary confinement you're isolated. And you have uh, a lot of time to think. Because we're only going out to the yard days a week. Wow. Depending upon if nothing else was happening in the prison, if there was a lockdown, then of course that would uh, eliminate the yard time. So you had a lot of time to sit around and study, or like some people were doing, just watch TV. The type of individual to just sit around and just live in inertia and not do anything. I, I, that in itself bugged me. I had to always do something. So that's why I started uh, studying words, reading about history, uh, philosophy, uh, psychology, sociology, about math, uh, math. I love math as well. And I started, I taught myself to draw. It's amazing what a person can do. I mean, it, it's a treasure of abilities in this uh, behind walls in prison. There's individuals here who could have been professional athletes in any category. Uh, there are individuals here who could have been professors, individuals here who could have been teachers, actors. They could have been excellent in uh, the modern technology of computers. There are many things that an individual can learn if he wants to. And why haven't they? What's the difference between the men inside and the men outside, besides those that are outside that maybe should be inside? Uh, what's your what's your perspective? What is the difference in those lives? Well, well, the disparity is this: we must first realize that this institution itself does not connote redemption, does not connote uh, self transition, uh, one uh, being becoming autodidactic, which is being self taught. These are things that an individual has to take upon himself. It's not the place; it's the individual. It's within. Unless an individual takes the initiative towards making that uh, redemptive transition, never be done. That's why individuals in society can, uh, you, you have many individuals out there who haven't or refused to make the self-transition. It's a matter of need, it's a, a matter of want, and it's a matter of understanding. And without that, uh, individuals will continue to live uh, the life of criminals, of uh, being diseducated. I guess it's also a matter of their even perceiving the possibility. Oh, well, you're absolutely correct because, and myself, I must admit that uh, for a long time, uh, beginning with uh, as being a teenager, I was a defeatist. I didn't believe that I could excel. I didn't uh, believe that I was uh, qualified to go out in society and compete against the other individuals in the world. I didn't believe that. Uh, it was a hopelessness. Uh, some people call it uh, self-victimization, uh, but the fact of the matter is the odds were, for me, and being a black uh, youngster, uh, the odds were totally against me. And I knew it, and I had to strive in whatever way that I felt could help me live. That's why I gravitated towards the so-called seedy side of our society, the underbelly. How important, you talked about words, I want to come back to that for a moment. Mm -hmm. How important do you think is having an expanded vocabulary for someone to be able to express and deal with their emotions as opposed to only expressing them physically? Is there a relationship there in your mind? What, between being able to uh, express oneself and the emotional aspect of it? Yeah, yes, versus if having a limited vocabulary, a limited way of expressing other than physical through violence. There's an old adage that uh, if your intellect is limited, you... you you compensate through violence. I'm convinced that when an individual increases his intellect, that it automatically helps to thwart that, that type of uh, aggression. It makes you think first. Because I notice that when 
I started studying and, you know, enhancing my vocabulary and towards redemption, I realized that the petty things that used to irk me that I would respond to like I was a marionette, uh, some puppet on a string, I realized that with common sense, I was able to avoid that, to not allow it cause me to whimsically react impulsively. I no longer was, was, you know, was able to do that. I stayed away from reacting like an animal. And when you think, it gives you the opportunity to, in a sense, outmaneuver things that will usually get you into trouble. And you think of ways that are productive in which to avoid it. Like I remember, you know, many years ago, guards would come by and they would say something, and I would uh, act a fool because of it. But then when they realized that they didn't have the weapon that they usually would have to manipulate me into acting a fool, then they left me alone. Hmm. So, see, these are, boy, I'm telling you, the intellect is something else. That's why I stress over and over again to children that you must get an education. You must, because in order to compete in this world, you have to have an intellect. And yes, there are individuals who become millionaires behind some skill or behind some uh, musical ability that they have. I mean, that's fine and dandy. But even them, if they, if they aren't educating themselves, they will lose that money. You're absolutely right. It's they will lose it because uh, accountants and other individuals will come along. Look at what happened to uh, Kareem Abdul-Jamal and other people. Yeah. You know, I mean, they took all of their money. Red Fox. I mean, that man, he was rich, but what happened? He died broke. Sammy Davis Jr. Broke. So you have to enhance your vocabulary. And you have not just your vocabulary, but you have to study. You want to know as much as you can about many topics. Because when you go out there and you're confronted with the world, it's not going to give you any slack. They're not going to have any pity. When you come to them, you must come right. You must have every tool at your disposal in order to achieve what you're striving for. You're, you're touching on it, but what would you say then is the core message that you're wanting to get to uh, young people that are considering being gangs. What, first of all, I should say, what is the pull for gangs, for black or white, for you know, for any background, Hispanic, any background of any individual? What pulls them to a gang, and what's your core message of your books that you're really trying to get across to move people to a different level? Well, first and foremost, there is no product or no sole factor that illustrates why youngsters are joined gangs. I mean, I can give you a variety of reasons. Uh, some as a substitute uh, family. Uh, some because out of uh, excitement. Others because they have uh, aggressive tendencies. Others because they it's a way then to have access to women. Others uh, because of the weaponry that individuals have access to. Drugs, money, uh, some because of uh, friendship. They, they assume they can find love there. They can find comfort there. They can find loyalty there. But uh, on the surface, those things appear accessible and, and they appear genuine, but you are jeopardizing your life for something that you're really not going to get because I'm sure many of these youngsters out there have heard about how individuals have turned informants and telling on one another and have no qualms about shooting their own brothers or hurting their own relatives because of uh, opposing gang activity and things of that nature. So it's many reasons why an individual will join a gang but uh, it's not uh, what they think that they're going to get into. I haven't met an individual yet who can stand before me and say that they got in a, a gang because of this specific reason and that's why they remained. They never go in and find what they're looking for. It's a continuous search for something that will continue to elude them and that's the scary part. Why do you think they've, uh, you know, this organization you started 34 years ago, the Crips, why has it grown to an international organization of such uh, intensity and, and, and violence? Because uh, it's become more of a fad than anything nowadays because all you have to do is look at the media, you look at the uh, uh, different uh, periodicals, newspapers, books, etc., etc., that glamorize that life. Rappers do it, uh, 
books and periodicals do it. Uh, you have it to where uh, the Crips have been sensationalized to the point that where individuals who don't even know the history of it are embracing it and getting killed over something they know absolutely nothing about. And it's not just uh, throughout uh, the United States, but it's also in Europe. It's also in South, have a South African Crips, if you can believe that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's become so attractive to destitute youth. To them, it's something that they can embrace, that they can feel a part of, whereas anywhere else, uh, they're not getting those needs met. What was the original purpose of the Crips when you had formed it 34 years ago? Uh, primarily to protect ourselves against the uh, neighboring gangs, period. That's what it was for. But slowly but surely, we mutated or morphed into what gangs were. We ended up initiating the same thing that they did to individuals who weren't in the gangs, we started doing to them, taking their money, taking their leather coats, making them change. You know, so we reversed it on it. We did the, you know, the same thing that they did to others, we did to them. One of the first acts you did that uh, got some individuals, and especially Barbara, to know you were authentic and this was not some game you were playing, that the reality of who you are was showing up, is she said that uh, all the people in the prison said that when she was spending her money to help try and organize this meeting where you could talk to both Crips and Bloods and try to broker a peace, they also do it because you'd be risking your own life and you weren't telling the truth. Why'd you do it and what did you say to these young men that got them to do something most would have thought was impossible? Well, uh, the fact that it was me who initiated the speech, that helped a lot. You know, I didn't say anything that uh, I'm sure that other political leaders and activists and other gang members were saying out there. It's the fact that it was me, a person who created, helped create the Crips with uh, Raymond Washington. As the fact they never thought that I, of all people, would sanction a truce between Crips and Bloods because, as you know, we were eternal enemies. Yes. And because of my stance throughout my life, people thought it was an impossibility for me to alter my life, to want to even see any type of uh, truth, because in a sense it would be like an affront to the brainchild that I, myself and Raymond came up with. So that was uh, a relief for them, because then they also knew that with that would come many other gang members, both sides, right. who would see, hey, if this man can do it of all people, why can't I? Hmm. That's, that's the message I hope everyone gets as they hear your story. I guess there were about 35 people in the yard at the time you were doing the filming for this that these Crips would be uh, seeing later on, and I, I understand that there was a standing ovation when the Crips and Bloods came together at the end, which no one could believe or dream, guys hugging each other. I mean, things you'd never picture in a million years. Well, no, it was it was more than 35. It was close to 400. 400? Yes, it was in an auditorium. Wow. Uh, it was doing a, uh, a gang summit but held by uh, Hands Across Watts at that time. And uh, they were happy. And, you know, of course, I didn't get a chance to know about the response until the next day. But I must admit, I was elated, too. Because, if I look, I've been away from society for many years. And individuals in prison, of course, know who I am. And, you know, they hear uh, my so-called uh, exports in here. But those society, they get little, you know, tales here and there. And they're not fully uh, conversant about what's happening with me. So for me to do that, it just enhanced the effect. I was very glad to be able to do it. And then the 35 men I was talking about were the ones in the yard witnessing you doing this. And I was understanding. Well, well, they, no, is that right? Did they convert? No, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't see anything. Oh, interesting. Uh, I never had a chance to see the speech itself played uh, on TV at all. Wow. Just like I haven't been able to see uh, Redemption, the movie. They, you know, Although FX had uh, requested or uh, asked 
uh, San Quentin where they allowed, you know, here where they offered five or six DVDs of the movie Redemption and they said no uh, to that. Well, I mean, let's face it, uh, I'm on death row and the last thing that this piece would want to do is promote uh, my uh, reformation, my rehabilitation, my redemption. I mean, you yourself, I had stated to you before, you've never heard coming from any death row where they would praise or laud or extend kudos to any individual on death row for any type of positive behavior or project or what have you because the demons makes it easier to facilitate matters for society itself at this stage um, tell me this what what is the purpose of your life and that whatever time you have what is the purpose what do you think the purpose of life is for anyone well the purpose of life I believe for anyone is to reach out to their fellow man and when I say man I'm just using that as a generic term I'm talking about both male and female so it's to reach out to your fellow man. I, I see nothing of great importance than being able to reach out to one's fellow man and help them. Because without that, uh, we know that violence will continue. That's why you have terrorists. That's why you have uh, armies. That's why you have the police and things of that nature. Because individual, everybody it seems, are at one another's throats. And without this form of humanitarianism, this form of peace, these atrocious acts of uh, suicide bombers, of uh, senseless killings, uh, gang warfare, dope warfare, and all of that, that type of madness will continue. I believe the greatest cause is to push forward and to struggle to help uh, one's fellow man. I never would have thought I'd be saying that to you. And if you would have brought this up two decades ago, well, put it this way, I never would have talked to you two decades ago yeah. because that wasn't in my consciousness. It wasn't what I believed. It wasn't what I feel. I didn't feel that then. I was a totally different man back then. I was the antithesis of what I am today, the direct opposite. And your life was really about yourself, wasn't it? Oh, well, yes. I mean, I was selfish. It was me. I wanted to survive. And I would do anything to survive. I mentioned we're going to the Middle East in April, and we're going to be meeting with a young group of people both on the Palestinian side and the Jewish side. And specifically, there's obviously rage on both sides, but we're going to be able to actually interview and talk with a couple of kids that are being trained to be suicide bombers. Uh, yes. And uh, I love, since you shared it with me there, but I'd like to capture it recorded here. I asked, you know, here are kids that believe that by dying, they're first of all honoring God, they believe that they're honoring their family, they mm -hmm. believe that it becomes significant in a world where they feel insignificant. So death to them is the goal. What would you say to these individuals who believe death is what life is about, that this is what their religion is? Or it's the only that, choice to make a difference? That is a quite uh, awful a, uh, and abysmal question. It's, uh, the answer to that is just, I mean, what can you say to children who are being taught that? I mean, the topic of religion in itself is quite tricky. But uh, I say that any dogma that uh, causes harm to another human being must be reevaluated. And you're talking about death here, a promotion of death. And me, I believe uh, the God that I know, that I believe, uh, doesn't promote uh, suicide bombings or assassinations or killings of any kind. Just think if humanity per se adhered to that philosophy of death, that philosophy, that philosophy of killing, well, let's face it, uh, no human being would be left on this earth. You're talking pure death here. I believe that uh, each child, be he or her Jewish or Palestinian, I believe that they all want to live, they all want to be able to you know, strive for to to see their their family uh, excel as well as them. Uh, my approach to them wouldn't be about the subject of death and murder. I I would have to talk to them about life and how to perpetuate life and how to do it through peace and uh, respecting one another. And that's much easier than trying to kill one another, kill one another's so-called uh, enemy. Actually, they'll find that they have more in common with the next human being than they, ha than they can imagine. But 
because of the circumstances in the Middle East or anywhere else uh, with the uh, Hutus and the Tutsis as well in Africa, if they were to sit down and actually confer with one another and discuss the problems and learn to compromise, they will find that they have more in common than they don't. But because of the friction, because of the animosity and the prejudice between these two different ethnic groups, they feel that uh, there is no rapport. There is no, uh, no form of uh, reconciliation. But there is. Now you have a process you call the peace protocol. Uh, yeah. You've, you know, rather than just talking about this verbally, you know, you've wanted to make it clear that there is a specific set of steps that anybody, organization, gang, individual, can do to produce a change in an environment like that. Can you walk through some of the pieces of that, just the overview of it? Well, I mean, I'll give you a synopsis of it. Uh, in regards to my peace protocol, I've been saying over and over again that it is a step-by-step -step process that any individual who has the determination to establish a truth and to establish a social agenda, it can be done. But I must say to anyone who's listening to this that a peace protocol or any type means nothing. It'll be redundant and it will be worthless unless there's a social agenda included. And what I mean by social agenda, I'm talking about a process, a plan that will reintegrate individuals back. The so-called um, criminals, uh, thugs, uh, gangbangers, dope addicts, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera, that will integrate these individuals back into society. And the only way to do that is to teach these individuals, uh, help them so that they can be familiarized with uh, modern technology, computer technology, uh, helping these individuals to gain uh, honest employment, help them to gain better housing, help them uh, and teach them how to compete in society today. And there's nothing that's really difficult in putting forth a peace protocol and plus individuals who say that well there's nothing out there to help us or to show us how well the individuals or the former gang members their former gang members are uh, Bloods and Crips and the disciples out there in New Jersey who are in my peace protocol and it's proven to be quite viable so they're showing that uh, it works and it's being used in other uh, local areas in LA and other places so as I stated before it can work but you have to have the determination to put this together and you have to believe it can work and not allow anything any other type of circumstances to thwart an individual or to thwart you from making this work it can work I know it can work one of the limitations that, that seems to be a part of anybody's life is their own self-definition, their idea. Yes. And, you know, was, after I left you a couple of days ago, I actually went and visited with the Dalai Lama, and I was about that you're truly one of the most spiritual and, and psychologically developed men that I've met in my life, and I've met people all over the world, leaders all over the world, your extraordinary soul. And I talked to him about how people love out of their need for certainty to lock into somebody who's bad. And he described he said, in his travels around the earth that the same person is so good, you put them in another context and they often behave very differently. You take somebody really bad, you put them in a different context, they behave very well. And that it's, all, you know, it's an illusion that people are one way or the other. That once we buy into that as a society or as individuals, it controls the way we respond to others, it controls the way we respond to ourselves. Our need to stay consistent with the way we define ourselves Literally, shit, we don't know what to do. So who were you? Who are you? How has that identity shaped you? Or how would you describe the fact, the kind of identity that causes someone to be trapped in violence or trapped in gangs? Where does that negative identity, if you will, come from? Well... Questions all at once? Oh, well, yes. But I, I, I can <laughs> Tell me the it. secret to life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can handle it. No problem. Uh, I know you can. Still. But, uh, I mean, when you're talking about an identity... And as you stated, it is formed and shaped by the ambiance of the environment in which a person lives. I understand that because of the fact that 
I believe, had I been reared in a milieu where where there wasn't a prevalence of, of violence and criminality and things of that nature, I believe that I would have stood, I'd like to believe that I would have stood a better chance. But the molding of my identity was done in order to survive in the particular environment that I was in. What I'm trying to say is that I had to become a great actor. I had to learn to pick and choose things that would help build my character. And they were all negative, but yet and still, it's what I needed in order to form myself. It was similar to what uh, Frankenstein did, uh, Dr. Frankenstein, when he created uh, the monster Frankenstein. It was uh, it was built of pieces that were, you know, from uh, different parts of uh, society. Uh, the aggression, uh, the violence, the uh, indifference, the intoxication to in a, drug you and, and make you comatose to what was going on in society, the, the defeatism and things of that nature. These are things that, that I took and molded my image in order for me to survive. And that's what people do, at, at least where I came from. The images that I built and the images that other individuals built, this so-called self-identity was built in order to survive, in order to impress, in order to exist. And that's why I became that particular person. Now you told me when we met the first time you had to, she realized in that environment you didn't have a choice to not deal with violence. It was dealt toward you and you had to decide to be a victim or... Oh, a victimizer. Mm -hmm. And I saw what uh, being victimized, I saw the... Uh, the outcome. I didn't like that. I, I wasn't a, a masochist. I wasn't into uh, enjoying pain. I didn't even like the uh, biblical beatings that I was getting from my mother, yet alone uh, the fist of another person. So, no, I had to learn to defend myself. And in doing so, I had to meet violence with violence. And, and that, that uh, proverb, that maxim about uh, violence beginning violence is, is so true. Mm. And in that time, your mother actually was very strong in preaching to you to turn the other cheek. But... Oh, oh, yes. Well, see, the thing is, is I was a model son at home. But once I left outside the door, I had to morph into another individual to meet the madness that was beyond the family home. I would have never existed had I adhered to my mother's ideology of turn the other cheek and uh, don't fight things of that nature. I had to defend. I was a male growing up in, in a pecking order, so to speak. And either you fight or you get uh, trounced on. Simple. Right. Now, I, I guess you also learned that violence is a source, source of power in that environment, not just a source of survival. Oh, well, of course. I mean, it was through violence that uh, individuals would keep the so-called imaginary power that they have. But in the, in the total scheme of things, we're not, nothing but a cog in the wheel of society, uh, regardless of how powerful we were. Right. So then you find yourself in prison, and prison for you seemed to be, everything you heard about it, I guess, was it was a place for gladiators. It was a place to prove you were a man. Well, uh, people who go to prison, who end up going to prison, will find out that uh, it's a total antithesis of that. Uh, there's no such thing as a gladiator school. I was led to believe that you would come here, and uh, if you had a problem with an individual, that you and him would uh, fight mano a mano, uh, one, head up, as we call it in the streets but that's not so just like they're a drive-by with uh, nine millimeter and all the other type of AK-47 and things of that nature out there in society there are drive-bys in here with knives and picks and things of that nature where an individual will hit you and just take off running so this is this is not a glass school it's nothing like that person will get hurt thinking that as you told me you said it's filled uh, to a great extent with cowards well, there's, there's plenty of cowards here. There's plenty of uh, informants here. And there's plenty of cowards and snitches in all prisons. This place isn't uh, some uh, recherche reality where uh, it's, it's just happening here on death row, but it's everywhere. Why, why the black-on-black -black genocide? Why, you told me when we first met that you felt a great hatred for those within... No, you're right. Uh, I, I remember that question. 
And the fact of the matter is, I was conditioned on self-hate. Uh -huh. This self-hate is what made it possible for me to have no remorse whatsoever to attack uh, a mere image of myself, which is another black person. Uh, that's why individuals can go out there on a regular basis and have and just be totally indifferent about uh, hurting or killing their own kind because of this self-hate. I've stated before, when you read the back of my uh, memoir, I had stated how it was like for me and most uh, individuals that I knew, it was like a cleansing effect that you feel that uh, if you can just destroy that, that negative uh, inferior image that is supposed to be a part of me, a part of us and others, that it would somehow purge us. But of course, that's a delusional thought as well. And where does that come from? What, the self-hate? They have the imagery of the African-American as someone to hate, someone to fear. Well, it, it, it comes from a conditioning, a belief that uh, blacks in general are inferior people. I mean, let's face it, our ancestors were slaves in this country. And although there is no slavery, the denouement, the outcome, the results of slavery is a rifeness of uh, racialism. Uh, uh, that uh, portrays us as being uh, subhuman, as being inferior, and as uh, Caucasians being superior. And when you see these images of yourself in newspaper and periodicals on TV and movies and things of that nature that depict blacks as being uh, buffoons, as being um, vicious, as being obscurious, as being three-fifths of a human being, as being illiterate, as being... Uh, redolent and any other negative connotation that you can come up with you start to believe these things you start to live these things and it becomes so deeply inveterated in your life to where you see nothing but negatives about yourself about your people and you, I mean you believe it and you live it and that's exactly what happened with me I was conditioned to believe that that's why None of us had any problems by praying on another black person, praying on uh, one another. And are you saying that uh, you are completely the product of your environment? Yes, but for me, I was a product of my environment, and I was ill. I say ill, I was, I'm not talking about uh, a genetic uh, illness or organic like that that has to do with the brain. The illness, the pathology that I'm talking about was something that was from conditioning. That's why I was able to heal myself. You heard that term, physician, heal yourself. Yes. Had it been genetic, then I would have had to go through something else, a psychiatrist, a praxeologist, a psychotropic drugs, or something of, to that effect. There's some, quite a few individuals here are going through or experiencing. Fortunately, mine was not genetic. It was a condition. Therefore, all I had to do was learn how to recondition myself. And that's what I did. It was a form, it was a melody of reconditioning myself. And I was able to be successful at doing it. You really uh, developed yourself spiritually. Is it really how you made that transition, is it not? Oh, without. I mean, I had, there, there has to be a sense of uh, spiritual cultivation. A lot of people put too much emphasis, they underscore religion in itself. I mean, I'm not speaking out against it. I'm not railing against it at all. But I believe, in my opinion, that spirituality is by far more paramount than religion will ever be. Because when I say, when I talk about spirituality, I broke it down to you once. We already know that the spiritual aspect, we're talking about the soul, the spirit, the pneuma, but when we're, or the id. But when we're talking about duality, the part of our spiritual, we're talking about an act, a deed, a performance. So when you break it down in my way, you're talking about a spirit act or a spirit deed or a spirit performance. So you're talking about something that is beyond oneself, something something that's, uh, what I say here, helping thy brother, reaching out to, to one's uh, neighbor. As opposed to just saying you believe something or subscribing to a set of beliefs. You also said to me something I found interesting. Well, let me say this real quick. Yes, please. And my belief is, you know how people say, yes, well, I believe in God. No, I don't believe in God. I know God. Hmm. That has enhanced. That's why I was able to uh, embrace uh, redemption and uh, self-transition such fervor.
Well, one of the things you said to me that I thought was beautiful is you said if you were going to make a mistake in your relationship with God, I'll let you finish it. Oh, well, yes. I believe that that's why I had no qualms about telling anyone who would listen that I believe in praying to a preacher or, you know, an imam or anyone of that nature because if I'm going to fail in front of God, if, I, if I'm going to fail in my effort, let it be on my own merit because there is no human being on the face of this earth who is infallible. We all are fallible. Therefore, if I'm going to stand before God, if I'm going to present myself to God or pray to God, I'm going to pray to God with my fallibility in effort to try to eliminate those errors, those, those vices, those things of those names, of, of that ilk. I'm not going to rely upon anyone else. I don't want anyone else to intercede on my behalf with God. If I'm not worthy enough to speak to God directly, then what is the use? Hmm. But you would appreciate some help with the governor. Well, the governor, you, preachers, uh, teachers, professors, uh, actors, uh, anyone else who can help. Right. I need help from everywhere. I need prayers everywhere. In the past, you had an enemy you could physically fight. In this case, what's the difference? Well, as I stated to you, um, this is a different type of battle. It's not a battle whereas I can go into a and fight eight or ten people and come out of there with my life. It's nothing like that. It has nothing to do with uh, physicality at all. I'm fighting against uh, a system, a juggernaut system that uh, can smash me and anyone else on this planet. I personally, at the age, I'm totally insignificant. What I look for is, as I stated earlier, the, the conducement from you, from other individuals and other supporters who believe in what I'm doing and what I'm striving to do, and that is uh, extend a message, a powerful message to youth everywhere so that uh, they can avoid uh, the negative pitfalls that I have uh, fallen into in life. And when you and I spoke, I asked you, uh, why are you there? Why are you in prison today? I'd like to talk a little specifically about the murders that have come against you. And But first of all, you said, uh, well, why are you there? Let me just ask you that. I'll let you into your own words. Well, I believe in karma. And I believe that the reason why I'm here is because of many things that I've done untoward black people that... Uh, I was never convicted of, never arrested for. I believe it was an accumulation of those things which I'm here for because the murders that I've been convicted of, I did not do. I'm not culpable for those. Now, I want to point out you have apologized publicly about all the things you've done, including helping to create the Crips and the violence they brought on, and you've daily worked to make a difference in that area, but you've never apologized for these murders, and some, for that reason, think you deserve to die. Tell us about that. Well, I find that to be somewhat uh, a paradox. Uh, it's more of a contradiction, not on my part, but those who say those things. Because first and foremost, I believe that an apology or remorse in itself connotes guilt, uh, which I'm not. In fact, it would be disingenuous on my part. It would be the sign of a coward to apologize just to save his or her life. And that's something I would not do. Or, I mean, albeit I, I can empathize with any family who has lost a loved one. But honestly, uh, I can't express uh, remorse or make an apology for crimes I did not commit. Uh, to do so would be a cravenous act. You know, and uh, the reason why I apologize to black people is because they are the ones that I committed atrocities against. I have no qualms about apologizing or, or to mea culpa to anyone who I've offended. Had I done those crimes, I would have no qualms about apologizing. But to do so would... It would just fly in the face of um, my innocence. And I have too much integrity 
to lie about something like that and to apologize for something I did not do just to save my neck. Uh, that would be wrong. You know, you, when I first met you, Stan, um, I was so moved by who you are as a man. I mean, everything you live and everything you teach is what I live and stand for, only I think you express it even more elegantly. Uh, frankly, you're more articulate than I am. Well, but, uh, yeah, I, okay, well, you know, I don't know what to say about that, but you've shown your success. I've seen your success, so go ahead. <laughs> but my, my point is that uh, I was so moved, but I, I came in with the belief uh, that it's very possible that you changed. I wanted to look in your eyes and I wanted to spend mm -hmm. enough hours that I could back to the governor and look him in the eye and say, this is what I believe and why I believe it. And not yeah. just hearing what you say, but remember, getting you to remember moments when things occurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions, one of the things I had in my mind was, okay, I was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that you've had this transformation because, you know, as you say, for a decade plus you've been giving your soul every day way beyond anything you have to do to try to position yourself yeah but more importantly my experience of you and anyone who meets you for an extended period of time looks and hears you I mean there's, there's a level of spiritual development here and an emotional psychological commitment and strength that you see in very few souls but I did in spite of all that still walk in with a preconceived notion based on your background that mm -hmm. If you didn't do this, you know, situation, you probably did something else, as you've described, and that, you know, whether you actually committed these murders or not, you know, your good works deserve clemency after 25 years of serving and all that you've done now. But my a question I asked you, and I'd like you to answer it for everyone, is why wouldn't you have done this back then? I know the man you are today would not yeah. have committed these murders, but why wouldn't you have? And, you, you know, I was, I was floored by your answer. It made so much sense. It's quite simple. Uh, I say to you and to those who are listening that uh, under any kind of in-depth analysis of my background, it would show that I was conditioned to prey upon, uh, to hate, and uh, to perpetuate violence against black people, uh, not white folks, uh, not Hispanic, or any other ethnicity. This is what I was conditioned to do. I was conditioned to, uh, in order to survive, to prey upon drug dealers, uh, black drug dealers, black pimps, uh, black hustlers, and other criminal types, uh, all of them were my prey. And for me to go out that realm, was, uh, it, it wasn't my uh, MO, it wasn't my modus operandi. That wasn't something that I did. If, if I wanted to make money or get money, I would prey upon these so-called uh, criminal types because of the simple fact. They could not go to the police. They could not. I mean, what are they going to say? Here, here's a drug dealer saying, hey, uh, Stanley Tookie Williams robbed me last night and took my drugs and my money. No pimp can say that. No hustler can say that. No any type of criminal. They, they can't uh, complain. These are things that we dealt with amongst ourselves. If they had a problem with it, then come for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Of course I do. I don't know what makes so much sense is why would you go outside the city and try and rob a convenience store for 75 or $200 and then kill people in cold blood when you can get thousands of dollars from a guy around the corner who can't go to the police and you have no risk. And this is not only how I thought, but this is how the, the inner circle of Crips, we thought. We preyed upon those who could not tell. We didn't go out and, and rob uh, Joe's mother or Frank's mother or something, something like that. We didn't rob those places. I've never touched those places. No one can ever say or accuse me. There's no, there's been no allegations of me doing anything toward a church, a black church, or toward a black business or something like that. Once I realized where the money was and that it was almost an impossibility unless these people were hurt, seriously hurt, you know what I mean? Yeah. That they could report me to the police. Plus, as you explained to me, you were a gangbanger. You guys didn't do these things as individuals. You went in packs. So you yes, yes, yes. Uh, power in the group. Know, of course. We, we were uh, thugs. We were gangbangers. Yeah, so it's not something you did just on your own. What's interesting for those listening is there is, uh, obviously we've done our research on this to be able to support and clarify things for the governor. The governor's uh, perspective, according to some, had been that you've had a fair trial of your peers and that you were convicted by your peers and that you've exhausted all appeals.
but in reality there was no physical evidence whatsoever at the scene that ties you to it. There was, uh, there's actually a bloody footprint and fingerprints that are not yours. Correct. Um, you were in a situation where there was not one African American on the jury. The gentleman who's the prosecutor has been sanctioned twice by the California twice. Supreme Court yes. for racist approaches to what he's done, and he kept any black jurors from being on the uh, team. And then describe how you were the five-point tie-down and what you shared with me about that. Oh, let me mention one other. Let me interject if I may, Stan. Okay. I left out a very important point. There were no live witnesses to these two murders, or these four murders, these two incidents. Uh, the only people that have testified are individuals who, one, was being investigated for a murder himself. Exactly. And none of them. They claim they heard you bragging about this. They didn't witness this. Yes, and yes. Even the, even the so-called accomplices never saw me do anything. That's right. But, but yet they say that I told them this. And, and they were given clemency, but they were let immunity. off Im immunity by yes. doing this. So they were able to avoid their own skins by claiming that the Crips committed these murders. Well, of course, and, uh, and because of my background, who would disbelieve it? I mean, I fit the bill. It was easy to throw these charges or allegations against me. No one would think that I didn't do it because of the fact of my uh, despicable background. But let me say this about the problems with this uh, particular case. I mean, the fact is, it's not only those things that you mentioned, but I mean, it was a, a paradigm of uh, blatant racism. We're talking about prosecutorial misconduct. We're talking about dirty cops. We're talking about IAC, ineffective assistance of counsel. We're talking about operatory evidence. We're talking about uh, bias uh, jury selection, uh, which uh, resulted in an all-white jury. And we're talking about also the misuse of uh, jailhouse informant, and, of course, the uh, illegal illegal uh, interrogation of witnesses, not to mention the involuntary druggings, which I'm about to talk about. Let me just mention one thing, Stan, before you go on. Uh, if you're listening and thinking, well, wow, he's, uh, this is a man who's not only articulate but well-schooled in the law after 24 years, and isn't he doing a nice job of loading us up with reasons to consider this? What I can tell you is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the state of California first in, 19, in 2002 recommended clemency for Stan for the amazing work that he's done over this decade and a half, but also this last year when they, the appeal was rejected to reopen the case and examine these items of the 24 justices on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Nine Appeal. dissenting. That's right, nine dissented, and the one who wrote the actual dissenting opinion, the, the female judge, Judge Johnny Rawlinson, uh, is actually an arch-conservative Republican. Exactly. And she, has, she has never, ever in her entire life voted for or supported someone on death row having a stay of their execution or clemency, including a bill that was for those who are meant handicapped, saying that that's a reason they shouldn't be put to death if they've, if they've committed murder. She supported that bill. So here's a woman who clearly would be the last person you describe, and she described the racism and the abuse of power exactly. that happened here. So exactly. this is not just Stanley defending himself or having a rap, but please describe what happened in, in the jailhouse to you, the, the druggings and the five-point, people probably don't know what five-point uh, Okay, well, I'll explain all of that in detail. And we're talking about uh, between the years of 1979 to 1981, periodically, I would end up in what they call a medical ward. Well, first and foremost, the reason why I was even there was because the DA at that time, Robert Martin, he had gotten a, um, a subpoena, a court order, to have me monitored under the guise of to, to find out whether or not I'd end up, uh, you know, self-incriminating myself or incriminating, you know, someone else. And that uh, they would monitor my visiting and they would monitor the phone calls. But the paradox, the contradiction is this. When you're in that medical ward, you're unable to have a visit or to use the phone because you're in five points. Five points is they're in a, a bed, in a bunk that's in the middle of the, uh, the cell and you have a leather strap on each wrist and a leather strap on each ankle and a strap that's across chest. That's why they call it uh, a five, five points. And periodically you're intravenously injected with some type of uh, psychotropic drugs. And not only was I involuntarily drugged, but I was involuntarily gotten up there. I was drugged to make it up there because I would never allow myself or anyone to take me up there uh, to something like that. They would have to literally kill me 
to take me to something like that, and they knew it. So before my food was spiked, and that's how I would end up there all the time, every time. And this would happen throughout the uh, entire years that I was down there in the L.A. County. This is during the time of the trial, correct? Yes, yes. And during the trial, you'd start laughing at times weirdly, or yeah, what the yes. judge even was questioning. What? Well, yes, and most of the time I was in a comatose state. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, the only way I knew what was going on about the trial was through uh, trial transcripts. That's the only way. Other than that, uh, I just remember obscure, but nothing significant. By the way, if you, were, if you were incredibly pessimistic or skeptical and you think this is a con conning you, telling you this horrible story about being drugged and taken advantage of and not being able to defend himself while he was in court, uh, one thing that would obviously clear up whether he's telling the truth about this or not would be his medical records, in which they have to show all the drugs that were administered and so forth. Conveniently or ironically, whatever you choose to believe, Stan's medical records are missing. Yeah, that's right. Of all the men on death row, He's the only person whose medical records are missing. I'm not suggesting in this case there's some giant conspiracy, but there are those who believe this man needs to die, and maybe evidence in, in other ways. You know, Stan would never complain about he was moved to the final cell that they put you in right before you're going to be executed. The rule is there's out 50 days out. More importantly, his execution date has been accelerated above other cooks who are also supposed to be executed. Specifically, one week before Stan stood before the board to be scheduled for his final execution, another man stood in his place who was scheduled to be executed and was given a January date for his execution. Stan is scheduled for December 13th. A week later, right before Stan faced the board, another man was given his sentence for execution and it was scheduled for March. Stan showed up on the same day and they accelerated him two months earlier than this gentleman. Why was Stan's date put ahead of these two men? Why, for the first time in California history, are we going to execute somebody a week Christmas? We've never executed people in December before. Some say it's because there is a commission right now investigating corruption within the application of the death penalty within the California prison system. Specifically, it was not set up by Governor Schwarzenegger, it was even before his administration. It's called the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice. And they're going to come out with the report of their investigations in January of 2008. Now, Stan has been in jail for 20 years. In fact, most of these men have been in jail on death row for more than two decades. They can't harm anyone. And so, as a result, a bill has been written that will be promoted in January, Assembly Bill 1121 in the state of California. And it basically is asking for a moratorium on all executions by the state until the California Commission of Fair Administration of Justice finishes its report under the simple logic that is if we believe there's potential corruption, misapplication of justice here, then why would we consider executing people until we find out if that corruption is involved in their cases? It's logical, it's intelligent. When he gets terminated on December 13th, he'll never have the benefit of that full investigation. So um, after this kind of treatment and uh, finding yourself for this many years, paying a price for maybe other things you did, but ironically under the cause or the base of something you do. How can you forgive the treatment you've done? How do you feel about America? How do you feel about society? You do seem to be a person filled with hate and anger and resentment, although I know you must have a certain amount of pain in that area. Well, it's, it's a matter of being able to uh, inhibit that uh, rage that a person feels. To say that not just me, but for any human being to say that they've eliminated uh, rage or hatred or anger entirely from their existence, is, it's just a lie. There's no such thing. Because as you know and I know, there is a duality in the world and in order for there to be a good, there has to be a bad, a small, a short, you know what I mean, small, tall, etc., etc., etc. So there's that duality. But it's, it's simply a matter of being able to inhi inhibit it, to control it. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, How do you do that? Uh, through my redemption, through my change. It's not only in my consciousness, it's in my heart to want to do better, to want to uh, not hurt anybody. Of course, uh, as I stated to you before, I'm not uh, a pacifist. I'm not uh, nonviolent to the point to where I would not uh, detect. 
my grandsons or my granddaughter or my family or things of that nature, as anyone else would. I'm sure if someone were, were trying to harm your family, you would do what is uh, impossible to protect them. But what I'm talking about is senseless violence. I, I don't doubt that, nor do I indulge in senseless violence. And so, you know, you've had a path of this spiritual development under the most difficult of all circumstances with injustice around you and the sense of hurt that you might have within yourself about the injustices you've been a part of. As you say, you chose to be a victimizer instead of a victim. What is the path of spiritual development? You've alluded to it, but if you were talking to someone who had a sincere desire to change their life, mm -hmm. what are the first two or three steps that will guide them on that path from your perspective? Well, first and foremost, they will have to want it. Uh, without the desire to change or want to enhance their spirituality, uh, it'll never happen. It begins with them, the choice, the personal choice. And without it, uh, they won't succeed in acquiring uh, what I call the uh, spiritual act, uh, the spirituality aspect of their lives, or being able to cultivate their uh, spirituality. And secondly, it's more of, I would just say, uh, renunciation. In other words, uh, giving up that which will harm themselves and others. In other words, we're talking about personal vices, uh, dealing with drugs, uh, criminality, uh, aggression, things of that nature. You're talking about renunciating an old lifestyle, a, a style of life, whether it's thuggery or criminality or what have you, that inflicts pain and harm on other people. Stuff that will cause oneself to end up being hurt or killed or in prison. And then it's about acts that... Well, of course. Uh, once, But see, unless you heal yourself, unless you heal thyself, then how possibly can you help to turn the lives around of other people? You must first go within. You must do a lot of introspection and heal oneself. Correct the wrongs that... Uh, afflict one mind and body and so then and only then can you honestly and seriously reach out to other people how do you i want to interject how do you heal yourself you know when someone feels lost inside when they feel they're rotten that they're they're destructive that they're not worth anything how do they heal themselves you say it's introspection but can you give us some guides to what that means well when you're talking about introspection you're talking about looking at all the things in your life that were or are destructive, things that will get you into trouble, things that will cause you to harm other people. It's a matter, uh, it's more of a cleansing than anything else. You're going into your life, you're turning it inside out, you're exposing that to yourself, which you know is wrong, and you're saying to yourself that, look, I'm making the choice here now that I'm not going to participate in anything that's untoward to myself or other people. It's a matter of, it's more like a defining moment. Now, your defining moments were created several ways. I asked you for people to know that this transition was really real. It's great to describe the process, but what were yeah. some of the moments? And as you said, you didn't have a Satori. No, but, or, an, uh, or an epiphany. Yeah, or an epiphany. But uh, you said, uh, I had to dig for a while, and you actually, I remember, came up with a moment that you thought that the, some of the change would be possible. Do you remember what you shared with me, or maybe you can share uh, it with those Yes, listening. well, it, it had more to do with when I to... Um, the L.A. County Jail, I was I was transferred from here to there for an evidentiary hearing, and it was during that uh, so-called uh, 1992 uprising uh, that was uh, germane to Rahim being beat up and things by the police. And when I got down there, to my amazement, uh, actually I was astonished, there were words in the holding tank that said, Crips and blood united forever. And it struck me as the oddest thing I've ever read in my entire life. Because you're talking about two eternal enemies here. You're talking about individuals that had no compunction about preying on one another, taking one another's lives. And here there were the words of unity 
forever unity at that. And looking at that, I had I had the opportunity to contemplate to, in a sense, allow it to marinate in my mind, and dawned on me that it was possible because of the simple fact that even on death row there are crypts and bloods here and there are no wars they haven't been badly if it's a problem between uh, a crypt and a blood here in San Quentin on death row they talk it out there's always a way to try to compromise to resolve the problem and I figured well, if it can happen up here how come it can't happen in society and that was truly one of my defining moments that convinced me that, well, look, if this so-called uprising can bring two foes, two feuding foes together in unity, then it can happen not only on death row, but it can happen anywhere. And that's, in a sense, uh, fomented my idea to write the peace photo. I also know that you did that in a very practical standpoint, because uh, as I understand, when you got back to the prison, uh, you saw our blood being surrounded by many crypts, because I guess, you know, this is not a one-on-one -on -one thing in the past. Oh, well, yes, there was an incident uh, in the uh, AC, solitary confinement, where it was just one blood on the yard with 20 or 30, 30 of us out there, and we were playing basketball, and... Uh, one of uh, the kids started trying to bully the blood, and the blood got upset and swung at him and things of nature, and I stood between them and asked what was the problem, and the blood said, look, he said, Tookie, this guy has been dogging me all day. He thinks that I'm a punk or something because I'm a blood, and I'm not. And I turned to both of them, and I said, look, if you can't resolve this verbally, then you go over in the corner over there and fight head up. So I asked each one of them, you know, separately. I asked Mario, well, you know, the person, did he want to uh, fight such and such? He said, uh, yes. So I went to the other guy in the crib and I asked him. And he asked me, uh, could I have a knife made for him? And my words were, hell no. No way am I going to do that. If you're man enough to fight him, mono mono and pugilistic style or not at all and for me that was a defining point because I actually you know established uh, respect from both of them and that's when I was introduced to uh, in a sense of fair play I mean here it is two men regardless of what their backgrounds are happened to be regardless of what gang they came from or what have you the fact that I was able to see it and understand fair play was a defining point in my life because that's something that I never would have done back when years ago my friends and I would have walked in and hurt the guy just on GP general principles and that's the way we were we're like pack animals you know Stan, um, when I first sat down with you here, I said I wanted to be able to hear you, see you, feel you, and then go back and deliver your voice, your message, your spirit, your emotion to the governor uh, to answer the question why you should live. Um, yeah. And uh, they wouldn't let me bring, as you know, they wouldn't let me bring a tape recorder in. Uh, they wouldn't let me bring in paper and, and pen. As you know, I was writing all over yeah. napkins. You were doing an excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Thank you, but this is your chance. Uh, now I'd like you to actually, if you would, speak as if you're speaking to Governor Schwarzenegger directly right now, because you will be. I'll be playing this portion for certain for him. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, why should you live, and what would you like to say to him, sir? Well, I know, I understand that this is a precarious moment, Governor Schwarzenegger. Uh, in essence, uh, I won't waste your time with uh, the usual legal formalities of uh, constitutional errors about uh, the racism or about my innocence. I must say that, admittedly, there's nothing special about me. Uh, I don't take myself seriously, but helping youth is more than a passion to me. Uh, it's my life. Undeniably, uh, my past is atrocious, uh, dishonorable, and unworthy of emulation by anyone. However, uh, years of 
self-transition, uh, redemption, and my faith uh, enabled me to purge myself of those uh, negative traits. I believe my dramatic change demonstrates to others that regardless of their wretched condition, they too can change their lives for the better. Now, I, I don't put to be a role model or a mentor or a hero. I'm simply a messenger warning you about the perils of the thug and uh, criminal lifestyle. You know, I remember reading somewhere uh, that it's your intent, God's nigga, to make California a better place. Well, I concur. It's my mission also to help uh, make California a better place to live for its citizens. Short, uh, I understand that my life is in your hands. And dare I say that I don't want to live just for the sake of living. I don't want to uh, simply occupy space or live in an inertia. My desire is to continue to be active and being an active part of the solution. More importantly, uh, I believe I bring more to the table than the physicality of my being. I bring forth a credible change uh, through my empathetic words, my books, my website, my conference calls, and viable solutions. Akin to you, Governor, uh, I too relied upon my indomination to make the seemingly impossible possible. I need not tell you about the necessary uh, discipline it requires to achieve. In conclusion, I would say that uh, I'm convinced if I'm afforded a clemency or an indefinite stay, uh, I'll continue to proliferate my positive message to all who will listen. Also, I propose that you, uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, your staff, and I, if possible, can initiate an active uh, youth project designed to uh, address the social ills. I'm willing to with anyone who has the best interest of the youth of today in society. And in ending, I say uh, Amani, which is peace. I know you'll reach him and there are enough people around to help get through and anyone can question anything, but if one looks at your life and your works, they demonstrated the truth and hopefully the very minimum that will occur is more time so that the facts of the case can actually be reviewed so that you could have eventually have your freedom. But I know what you're asking yeah. for here. Uh, to start with is just more time to be able to continue your good works and to also to prove your innocence. Oh, yes, without a doubt. I mean, there are two factors. Uh, I mean, with me being alive, my number one objective is to continue to help children. That's that's number one, quite naturally. Yeah, that's that's uh, my love there. I enjoy that. It's a necessity to help you so well. Uh, all ethnic backgrounds, religions, or what have you, or geographical locale here in America and or abroad. And um, the second most important thing is to be alive so that I can continue to strive to inevitably, which I believe, prove my innocence. So those, those two are the motifs of my efforts. And what keeps you going during, there have to be times in which you become overwhelmed sitting there in prison, sitting there for a quarter of a century, and now with your execution date only a few weeks away, what keeps you going? What belief? What faith? Uh, well, faith in God, uh, faith in my ability to continue to do my deeds, uh, my spirituality deeds, my spiritual deeds, uh, helping others. Doing that keeps me happy, it keeps me motivated, it keeps me going. Uh, helping others, I, I, it, it, to me, it's a form of alacrity and enthusiasm that keeps me going. You also told me about KC, a friend of yours, who I guess had a stay only two hours before his execution. And, and uh, how we talked. And he talked about how it took something from him, how it... Uh, made him appear as though he was emaciating and you could see it in his face his hair turned white he was even before the actual death it was like he was dying wasn't it well that's what this place does to a person 
but it hasn't done it to you, Stan. How come? Well, as I say, depending upon the circumstances and conditions, uh, each individual approaches it differently. I'm no better than Casey or anyone else. I have a different way of looking at things. So if you look at both of our backgrounds, uh, other than both of us being black, it was a total difference in the, the way we evolved in life. So me experiencing uh, a moribund type of uh, situations has, I mean, I faced it back then with a neg ignorance, uh, with uh, stupidity, uh, with a crassitude that was beyond imagination. But today I, I face the uh, experiences with uh, faith and with redemption. It's, it's entirely different now. I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life. It has nothing at all to do with uh, machismo or some sense of uh, manhood or some code of honor that I live by in the streets. So all that is behind me. What it has to do with is faith and redemption. That's why I'm able to face it. I also realize I'm a practical thinker as well. And of course I want to live, but this literally is out of my hands. There's nothing I, can, I personally can do. As I stated uh, earlier, this has nothing to do with physicality. This is, I'm fighting against a bad, an invisible entity in a sense. Well, it's not really even an entity. Uh, it's the law. It's a system that I can't touch with my hands. Uh, it's something that only uh, the governor and my supporters, hopefully, can help resolve in my favor. Well, we pray that that will happen, and our prayers are with actions, massive actions, as you know, in support of you. And um, I personally believe the governor's heart will be reached, uh, not so much because of our pleas, but because of what you have demonstrated to be real about you, Stan, for this decade and a half. And um, your prayers are with us, and your actions are with us. Your will has been amazing. One thing you told me when we were there in prison was, uh, you said that you're sitting there on death row, and you said that one of the reasons you don't go down, so to speak, is because you won't allow it. Is that true? How would you describe that? I think that belief system for people is important, because everyone finds himself in places not as difficult as your own, but what seem to them to be overwhelming. Oh, or, you know, what well, what yeah. is the belief? I mean, let's face it, uh, individuals who are noted uh, for their uh, spirituality and their beliefs such as uh, Jesus and Buddha I mean there were moments when they uh, were stumbling in their faith and in their belief it happens but you have that fortitude that picks you up I believe that not only my will to survive but the discipline that I acquired from bodybuilding uh, that determination to build up my body, I believe that is what keeps me steady and keeps me resolute in my convictions. And as I stated to you, I will never retrogress back to the negative lifestyle that I lived. It's just something that I will not allow myself to do. I just won't. I won't allow myself to uh, go back to that. I understand not, not uh, me. Yeah, they took away uh, your ability to use weights some time ago. With oh, yes, yeah, in 95. Mm -hmm. yeah, how come you're still so damn big? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I stay in shape because uh, I still exercise. I do a lot of uh, calisthenics. I do a lot of burpees, which is, in a sense, uh, a military-type uh, type, uh, push-up. Mm -hmm. but with more push-ups and more kick-ins and kick-outs, uh, depending upon the number. I have a six-count, which is one push-up, or eight-count, which is two push-ups and a kick-in. Uh, Ten-count is two push-ups, two kick-ins, and uh, 14 is three and three kick-ins. 22-count uh, is uh, five kick-ins and five push-ups, et cetera, et cetera, on up to 46, up to 100, and such, 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 such. How many do you do a day? I'm curious. Or do you do well, all to, totally, I do at least five to six, seven hundred. Every day? Well, six days a week. Oh, my God. So I guess there's a little bit of discipline in that. <laughs> well, there's discipline in that, of course, and that uh, is just a, a, it's a, a derivation from my bodybuilding days. 
you don't lose discipline. Once you have it, it stays because it becomes a part of you, like uh, your hygiene, keeping your hygiene up to par. And what about your mind? Tell us, what, what do you do each day? What's the size of your cell that you're sitting in there, and what do you do each day to, for this development of your mind? Do you read a certain amount of time or write? or? I get up between 4 and 4.30, and uh, first was cleanse. Uh, I cleanse myself uh, before I pray. I pray, which takes uh, from 40 minutes to an hour. And uh, after that, uh, I start typing, working on various uh, literary projects. And I'll get in that, I'll do that for a couple hours, and then I'll start exercising. I'll exercise, and then I'll go shower. Then I'll come back, and I'll start typing again. And uh, if I have a book of interest anywhere nearby, I'll start reading that. And then I'll get back to typing. Uh, you know, I'll use the phone, do conference calls as I'm doing right now. So I have more access to the telephone because they're, you know, preparing to execute me. So I'm allowed to have, you know, an ample amount of uh, phone time. We're grateful we have this time with you, to say the least. What's the size of your cell? What is it? Uh, it's, uh, I believe, nine by four, nine by five. Uh, there's a steel sink in here. A steel toilet, a shelf, a light fixture with fluorescent light, and uh, the cell door, it's a bar, but yet they have on the outside of it is a steel mesh. And the reason why they put these steel meshes on there, it's on every cell, uh, particular prison, I'm sure in all prisons, is that way you can't spear anybody that's walking by or, you know, either guard or prisoner. Right. Tell us, tell us about the, the books you're working on right now. I understand that you have three works. Oh, well, I'm, right now I'm working on Thoughts of Thunder. It's more of a compilation of essays that uh, address topics of violence, uh, pre-life, uh, racism, uh, religion, redemption, self-transition, the media. I must address that. Attorneys and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And another book that I'm working on is called uh, Female Gang Members on the Forgotten Gender. And I'm addressing uh, the violence and, the, you know, the gang activity that uh, women are experiencing and that they're, they're going through. So I believe that they need to be focused on as well because, as you know, if judging from the media and other periodicals and books, you would think that gangs are just relevant to males. But it's not. There are females also out there who are gang banging, who are involved, who are deeply uh, entrenched gangs, and they need uh, to be focused upon and helped as well. Right, right. And your and eventually, I want to do another series of uh, children as well. Well, that's wonderful. And right now, you, for those who don't know it, you have nine books you published in that in the area. Well, I have ten total. Ten total. And you've been nominated now for a Nobel Prize for Peace five times, nine Nobel Prize nominations, five for Peace, four for Literature. Um, how does it make you feel to know that your impact is not just happening in your own community, but the community of the world? Well, I mean, I'm honored to be nominated for those uh, awards. There's no doubt about that. But truly, my main objective is helping children. That's what I underscore more than anything else, because uh, without that, I would never be nominated for anything. And the fact of the matter is, I don't do these things. I don't try to help uh, youth or adults uh, to be recognized or to have, to be nominated or win some awards as I have for peace or literary material. I do this because I know it's necessary. I believe, for me, I believe for me that I'm responsible, that I'm obligated to help these youth out there. Because as you and I know, I guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of the people who criticize me, who point the finger at me, who are vindictive towards me, they can care less about the disenfranchised out there, the, the illiterate. They can care less. And I guarantee you that they're not try even trying to help them. So I'm doing what they should be doing. And you're so right, Stan. Uh, a couple last questions, if I may. Describe for me what is leadership? What does it mean to be a leader? As you know, there are so many interpretations of leadership. Uh, 
But uh, I can tell you what I believe the qualifications are. I believe that not only must an individual have the uh, noetic ability, being intelligent, things of that nature, but uh, she must have uh, charisma. They must have insight. They must have foresight. They must uh, have compassion and passion. They must uh, be able to mea culpa, uh, which is uh, to acknowledge one's own fault. They must be able to uh, empathize. They must be uh, strategic minded. Uh, they must be critical thinkers. They must uh, be able to feel and sense the pulse of uh, those individuals uh, he or she leads. They must be magnanimous. They must also have integrity, which is very important. They must uh, not be a hypocrite. They must uh, understand uh, redemption. They must have uh, the ability to change, uh, depending upon the circumstances, to meet the needs of whatever the people themselves need or whatever the circumstances require. They must be able to compromise. They must be able to uh, be creative and uh, have courage. Is that all? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm looking... I agree I, with everything I, you said. I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking at, in my mind, at uh, what is needed because you, I believe a leader is not when they say that uh, you can create or build a leader I, I disagree this is something that has innate it, ha it has to be a, a, an ability there has to be something there of course you can have many captains a captain a lieutenant and things of that nature uh, that's entirely different from the leader himself or herself there has to be a seed there, something that can be nourished, something that can be built upon. There must be a terra firma there, a solid ground in which to stand in order for a person to be a true leader. That's why there's not many you, yourself. That's why there's not many Martin Luther Kings, uh, Malcolm X's, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, individuals of that ilk and so forth and so on. I don't on. know if I belong in that group, but thank no, you. No, but, but uh, what I'm saying is you are a leader in your right. Yes, thank you. You know, so, and there's others who try to, but you've taken it and made it uh, international. You've taken it and made it uh, yours. Not anybody can do that. But anyone can lead themselves. Oh, of course. And how much of it is development? Because you say there's a spark, and we both, I'm sure, have met men and women who have the spark, but they've never had the discipline or the standards to take themselves there. Well, those are things that have to be uh, self-taught. Those are the things that one must pick up along the way. I mean, just like you have many potential singers, you have many potential rappers, you have many potential teachers, you have many potential politicians, but unless an individual acquires the wherewithal to make that uh, come into fruition, all of those, the seed, uh, the beginnings, it, it means nothing if you yourself don't nourish it. Just like I tell people that you can pray to God to be a millionaire, but if, if you're expecting God to just manifest a million dollars before your very eyes, you can forget it. You'll be waiting for an eternity. You have to put forth effort, and those prayers will be answered eventually. The same is applicable to leadership, the same is applicable to uh, redemption, the same is applicable to self-transition or any uh, radical change in one's life. Evolution requires effort, consistent, diligent, assiduous effort. In the, the issues of African Americans today who have experienced the racism that is implicit, even, even not explicit racism, but implicit so often in the messaging of our society, where people maybe not even intending it, they just don't, it's the invisible force, mm -hmm. as well as the explicit. What is your advice to African Americans 
they embrace and understand that this process is a part of it? Should they dwell on it? Should they use it as drive? Um, you know, I, what would be your advice to a young African American who has a okay. sense of hurt and obviously from that anger or rage? What, where should they put their folk? How do they deal with it? Do they live every day trying to fight it? Do they transform it? What What would you suggest? Well, to try to fight a pathology that uh, is incapable of of being uh, resolved, it's a waste of time. In other words, what I'm saying is you can't spend your time worrying about a philosophy because that's all it is. It's really a philosophical myth. It's not a reality. It's a reality when you start believing it and bringing it into fruition and making it tangible in, your own, in one's own life. In order to battle racism is not to ignore it per se, but to evolve in a higher form, which makes racism, prejudice, uh, being predilective and things of that nature, and bias, uh, bigotry, which makes all of that obsolete. It makes it pass se. You, you rise above it. You become more than anything that could ever attack you or challenge you. Exactly. If I, like now, I don't uh, believe that I'm inferior to any other human being. I believe we're all, despite the fact that I'm sitting here in a cell, I believe that I am on a level playing field with any other human being. I believe that because of the fact that I don't feel inferior. I don't think inferior. I don't move inferior. My actions aren't inferior. Everything that I do is to the best of my ability. And when individuals think and react and move in such a method, racism will mean nothing to them. Anybody can say anything they want about me. It makes no difference because I'm going to continue to do what I feel is right. I'm going to continue to do what I feel will help others. And I'm going to continue to do what enhances my inner serenity. This makes me feel good. I know that what I'm doing is right. It doesn't make me better. You know what I mean? It doesn't make me better than anyone else. It's just, it just makes it that I'm not harming anyone else. And your life has meaning. Oh, well, yes. Yes, I mean... A deeper meaning because it's not just about you. Of course. I mean, at one time, uh, I felt worthless. worthless. That's why I had no qualms about uh, ingesting drugs uh, that would uh, make my mind delusional, that would, in a sense, try to falsely blanket whatever problems I had that would eventually come back. I mean, once you go up, you, you still have to come down. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Galileo, Galileo proved that. <laughs> you, know, you know you know what I mean? Same is applicable. An individual, you can try to escape by rising above everything, by being intoxicated, but you will come down. Yeah. And when you come down, the, the fall is much harder than it was prior to you uh, ingesting those intoxicants. Tell me, um, is there anything, I've, I've got two other questions before I finish here, but is there anything I've not asked you that you'd like to share or say for anyone who's listening? There'll be kids listening, there'll be guys in prison listening and serving, there'll be people that are just in the general population that are listening who I want to show that change is beyond possible and, and the pathway. Is there anything you'd like to share about your life or message? I must accredit everything to you because you've done a fine job of asking all the queries that were necessary. I told uh, Barbara... Uh, the other day and earlier today that your questions have been more abysmal than any of, and all of the journalists I've ever talked or spoken with all combined. Hmm. You've asked more profound questions than any of them. You've got to the heart, to the meat of my life as opposed to any of them. Well, I'm, I'm honored, I'm honestly honored to have this time with you and I plan to be a friend to you, a friend in language or a friend in positioning, but a friend who shows up for you with real actions from this time on and celebrating with you on December 15th. <laughs> well, let me tell you that I will be more than honored to do that and I reciprocate, I accept your friendship and I reciprocate mine to you. Thank you, Stan, that was cherished. You know, and uh, I will cherish it, and I, too, look forward to celebrating 
December the 14th, December the 15th, whenever, however long it takes you to get here. <laughs> when, whenever that moment happens. Well, hopefully we won't have to wait to then. Hopefully we have a celebration before that. Day. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree, too. I agree, too. But, uh, you know, we're, we're just saying, you know. Yeah, I know. I understand. Tell me, what makes you, I mean, you're sitting there on death row. You've got you know, all the abysmal environmental stimulus you could possibly happen. What still makes you laugh? Well, I mean, I'm human. And uh, the fact that my faith, as I stated before, in redemption sustains me. Worrying, crying, feeling sorry for myself, or indulging in a woe is me syndrome uh, helps nothing. It, it does uh, create ulcers and some people's hair fall out, uh, some people's hair change colors. I have uh, a different perspective on life. Uh, I have that, uh, what I mentioned the other day, a swat vive, which is a love for life. Yes. Uh, I enjoy life and I enjoy every second, uh, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, and every year that I'm alive. Ever since my transition, my redemptive transition, I've changed completely. But to sum it up, to sum it up in a few words, I say that it is my inner peace that keeps me happy. Mm. Last question for you: What? Uh, how do you want to be remembered 50 years from now when you pass away? <laughs> Not a few weeks that, ago. That uh, I was an individual who made uh, a tremendous change not only in my life but more importantly in other people's life I changed uh, my own atrocious legacy to a legacy that could be respected that could be emulated and that could be appreciated that's beautiful God bless you Stan oh God bless you as well okay take care of yourself and we'll be celebrating soon oh yes and God bless bye bye all right bye well, that was Stan Tukey Williams, ladies and gentlemen, uh, an amazing soul whose amazing transformation. I hope by listening to this conversation, you've been inspired to realize what's possible, what can change within any human being when they become more conscious. And as I said earlier, you know, what is consciousness? Increased spirituality. It's an expansion of caring beyond yourself. And the greater that circle and the deeper that circle of caring goes, the more conscious we become. And this is a man who... I can't imagine anyone listening could imagine he's faking this or positioning this. And whatever amount of time he has left to live his life, you can guarantee one thing, his life will be one that's led every day in service. And I hope you've been as touched and inspired by him as I have. only wish is you could look in his eyes and feel his physical presence, but my hope is by transferring his voice from that cell to your ears, wherever you are today, you'll remember what you're grateful for. You'll stand up for what you believe in. You'll set a new standard for what you can give. And that you'll live every single day with a greater joy, a greater love, a greater appreciation. If you've ever felt like you were overwhelmed, if you ever felt like you had difficulty having joy in your life, remember Stan in that cell, step himself and experiencing a joy for every moment of his life by focusing on what he can give. If you're listening to this right now and it's before December 13th, anything you can do in terms of sending letters, making phone calls to the governor, this man's life is in the hands of one man, and that's Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. He can let him die, or he can preserve his life. Not necessarily set him free even, but preserve his life to continue to give. So if you have any form of influence, or if you have any time ring, please do something right now to move this agenda forward for clemency or to stay indefinitely Stan's life, a life of contribution. If you'd like to know more about Stan's life and be moved by his story, I highly recommend you rent or buy the DVD Redemption, starring Jamie Foxx. I think you'll be moved by it. You could also pick up Stan's memoir, Blue's Black Redemption, by Stanley Tukey Williams, and won the 2004 award for a season of nonviolence. And of course, Stan has a whole series of books, children's books. You can find out more on his website, www.tukey, T O O K I E com. That's again, www.tukey, T O O K I E dot com. And if you want to write Stan directly, you can write him at tukey at tukey dot com. Tuki at Tuki.com. I'm sure he would love to receive a message from you about how your life has been touched or how he can help you make a difference in your community of young people. Thanks for listening. God bless. And remember to live each day a life of passionate contribution.